unseaworthy, leaking boats, some with sick pregnant women and children and us having to, a young CO and a, a young crew having to manage a, a really tough situation like that. Welcome to the podcast where we track down Australian war veterans, have a chat with them and hear their stories. I'm Alex Lloyd and this is Life on the Line. The single greatest sacrifice I've made is in my family. We weren't out there to take country, we were out on your country. That was their job. I did feel a lot of regret. Friends were still getting killed. It got to the point where you know you were going to funerals quite Do often. Do I lead under fire? And that was a heavy responsibility, I guess, on my shoulders that I didn't want to screw up. Really resilient to get a poke War itself is horrific. It's a horror story. It should never be dressed up as if it's something glorious. Not what you can do for yourself, or what can you do for your country? The volunteer for service was in effect to put your life on the line. Darren Grogan is a Commodore currently serving in the Royal Australian Navy. He spoke with Angus Horden about his career to date, from time in the Arabian Gulf to border protection to bushfire assist, and about serving in the modern Navy. I'm Angus Horden, speaking over Zoom today with Darren Grogan. Darren, welcome to Life on the Line. Good afternoon. It's good to be here today. Darren, let's start with your childhood. I think I'm very lucky in that I can probably say I had a fairly charmed childhood. There was not much sadness or drama or disappointment. It was a very loving family, two big sisters, very working class, but in saying that, definitely didn't go without anything. So we're very lucky that our parents' focus was always on us kids. A Navy brat, so from a Navy family, um, even though the not a true Navy brat in that we got back from, my dad had a, a posting to the United States, to Washington. We got back from there the, the late 70s and from there, so I was about seven or eight then, from there we pretty much settled down. So I had a, a settled high school, which unlike many Navy brats, that's a, a positive thing. Also surrounded by lots of family and friends. One of those, always a thousand people around the house celebrating something, normally the Richmond Football Club old and bold so very proud of that so you're from melbourne then yeah melbourne boy from way back down on the the bay side so pretty much went to school down in mentone st Bede's, a, a good boys school down there down on the beach in mentone so besides your dad's service in the navy is there any other military history in your family yeah we've actually got quite a fair bit and i know one of my cousins has done quite a lot of research on this but a couple of uncles and aunties as well as cousins. So the current generation and the generation before. And then we go back to grandfathers and great grandfathers, all with a fairly strong uh, army background. So even though it was a, a Navy family growing up, as in an uncle in the Navy, an auntie in the Navy, and cousins, it wasn't, I think maybe because dad left the Navy before I joined, that it wasn't, didn't feel like a fairly strong. Navy connection at the time, much more so now when we reflect on it. So that's great grandparents who were in the First World War and then parents and, and other family that were in the Second World War? Yes, that's correct. So it actually goes back a, a fair way. And my cousin can link it. She'll be upset that I don't have all the detail on it, but she can link it a long way back. And any recollection, like with the great grandparents, were they Gallipoli or were they Western Front? Both. So we've had definitely links into both of those great, great grandfathers as well back in Britain, uh, the Royal Navy. So there's lots of links all the way back. Darren, can you tell us about your great uncle, Jack? He sailed with the first convoy in World War I, spent the, the whole war with the, the light horse. So fought in Gallipoli, charged on Bathsheba, and instead of going to France, stayed in the, the Middle East and ended up fighting the Turks um, again on the road to Damascus is nominated for the Military Cross with regards to that road to Damascus. And with regard to the Second World War service, you had, as you mentioned, um, family there as well. Grandfather tried to enlist when he was 15, but I know there's a story that one of my aunties tells that found him in an army camp at Broadmeadows and dragged him back to stall. He eventually signed his enlistment papers when he turned 18 and he served over in France and enlisted again for World War II, but wasn't fit for overseas service by that stage. So what was the main driver for you to join the Navy? 
I was young and even though I had a very privileged childhood and a loving family, I just wanted to see the world. Itchy feet, I didn't like studying. I was never very good at it. I got through it, but there was no, to me, no prospect in university that interested me. So the Navy seemed like a a pretty good way to achieve that, and it was. You go to the Naval College at Jarvis Bay to kick off your Navy career. Tell us about Jarvis Bay. Well, as a 17-year-old boy leaving home for the first time looking for adventure, it ticked all of the boxes for me. I found that I use the word easy in that I was so young, I didn't know any different. I went to an all-boys school, a reasonably strict family life, so I was used to doing what I was told. Suddenly I was 17 years old, had literally more money than I could spend and was with a bunch of new and interesting people. They were teaching me to drive warships. The hardest thing I did all during the day was learn how to march and do some drill and a little bit of PT here and there. I was a young, fit guy, so all of that stuff was fairly easy. And they, I learned instead of spending my time sitting in a classroom studying for a degree, I was studying for a future career, which was pretty exciting. Darren, I did my basic training at Creswell. I, like you, obviously loved the experience. I mean, there are lots of bases that you could be at to do your training, but could you run through for our listeners what your typical daily routine would be? You know, what time you'd get up, what you would do? I think it was probably what would be considered a fairly standard boot camp type routine, except for an officer, which I suspect was probably a little bit easier. We had the early morning exercise, so you're up nice and early to get out there and do some group PT. From there, you would normally go into the classroom where you'll do some general military studies and also learn about being an officer, like we call a knife and fork course, to be taught how to behave like an officer. From there, you also started the professional training, which included the the seamanship and the mariner aspects of being a maritime warfare officer that was ultimately preparing you to then start your specialist training. That would also incorporate into that leadership training and also survival at sea training, a bit of sailing, a little bit of everything. It wasn't a, a long and strenuous course, but it was a really good introduction to the Navy and an introduction to the ADF. So how long was your course at uh, Creswell? So quite short. I think it was about eight months. So just basically that working year. We joined late in the February and finished at the, the end of the year. I joined a, what they called a, a supplementary list officer, which was a, a scheme that didn't go for too many years. I always argue that maybe they tried it on me and it wasn't a success, so they got rid of it. But there was just a, a handful of us under 18 kids that weren't going to ADFA, so weren't going for the degree, and who were going to go straight to sea to get their bridge watchkeeping certificates. Uh, That scheme didn't last for too long then. It's come back in a similar fashion now with uh, the direct entry scheme, but not quite as young as we were back then. Because when you look at it, the group of other group of students that were with us varied from 40-year-old qualified engineers through to 17-year-old kids. So when you leave Creswell, are you a midshipman? Yeah, still a midshipman. And then you start your specialist training basically the maritime warfare officer learning to drive a ship. Now, had you elected that specialty or or were they allocated that to you? Yeah, you joined as that. So once I joined, I signed the dotted line as a a ship driver versus could have been obviously an engineer where you would have needed a degree or logistics. But my plan was always to be at sea as quickly as I can. So let's talk about those first few years at sea. How did you find actually getting your feet on the deck? Uh, It was probably... Still is the best few years of my naval career. Again, I was 18 years old. I was given pretty much everything, food, water, clothes, still paid. We traveled, literally traveled the world back in those days. The difference than now is that there wasn't as much strategic consequence to our deployments in the, the late 80s, 90s. We would go away for a long deployment and have enjoyable port visits for extended periods where it was all about the engagement with the the local country. Even when we were back in Australia, we still lived on board the ship, which was obviously different than what it is now. So you worked the day, you then hung out with your mates on the ship and then went out and had drinks and beers and food and sort of came back. 
that camaraderie that comes from living together on a ship, especially in home port, is something we don't see as much anymore now because nobody lives on ships and everyone gets rental assistance. But just to the countries that I ticked in those first couple of years as a sub-lieutenant officer of the watch, so my responsibility level was <laughs> quite low. Um, I got to do cool things like drive ships around the ocean, but the responsibility and the, the authority level wasn't there. I had a pretty good time. Your first ship, was that uh, Perth? Yes, HMAS, but I had, I'd been on a, a couple of patrol boats before that where we do our training and, and also Jarvis Bay, and, but that's all part of the training cruises. My first ship where you go is what we call then a, a phase four, where you go to get your bridge watchkeeping certificate. So basically your driver's license. When I got my ticket on board HMAS Perth, that was part of a, a fairly significant deployment where we went over to Crete and the Suez Canal and Egypt, places like that for a deployment for an 18, 19 year old was very exciting. And of note, I then got my bridge watch keeping certificate, so my driver's license. I had that before I actually had my car driver's license. So I would always have someone drive me around <laughs> when we were sure, but I was all right to do it at sea. Can we explain for our listeners, like Perth the DDG, one, you know, one of the older ships, can you explain what sort of ship she was? Oh, old guided missile destroyers, they are big destroyers. They were coming to the very end of their life at that stage and they were then to be replaced by our FFHs, our frigates. So at that stage, we are down to just the FFGs and the FFHs. But now the what we would con probably consider the replacement to the DDGs are our air warfare destroyers, ships that we now have on the line, the Hobart and Brisbane and Sydney. How long were you on Perth for? Uh, it was only a fairly short time, so I was on board for probably a, a year and a half, maybe two years before then heading up to Darwin to navigate my patrol boat because that was at the time where I streamed a specialisation for navigation. Did you spend some time, I remember you were the decommissioning officer or the decommissioning navigating officer, sorry, on Derwent. Yeah, so once I, you navigate your patrol boat, which is your, your first job as a navigator, quite a junior officer, sub-lieutenant. From there, you then go do your more advanced navigation course before then navigating the major fleet unit. So from that, I then went and navigated HMAS Derwent, which was for her decommissioning trip. I've been lucky to be involved in a couple of decommissioning. So I've decommissioned HMAS Derwent. Then I wasn't actually there on the day of the decommissioning because I got peer jumped to go to HMAS Melbourne, one of our frigates, to as the navigator, so I missed the actual decommissioning ceremony, but was lucky to be part of the whole decommission deployment where we prepared for it. I've subsequently decommissioned uh, two ships as, a, as the commanding officer, which is a, an interesting experience knowing that you'll be the last person to walk off that ship ever, which you are as the commanding officer. It's funny, um, Darren, I have fond memories of doing I served on a uh, back in 87 over in the Indian Ocean. I mean, after you were on Perth, DDG, you then stepped down to Derwent, which is a destroyer escort. Can you explain that ship to our listeners? I stepped down, but I went up in position. I may have been a, a junior ship driver on board the, the large DDG. I then became the navigating officer, which was the next level up from the officer watch on board the destroyer escort, which, as you said, were the, the smaller ships, more of the, the working class, as in the workers of the fleet. We used to take them pretty much all the way around the world, and they were always a, a lot of fun as a ship for a deployment. By then, again, they were starting to get very old, and that was part of that transition of our fleet into the, the more modern Navy. Oh, good times, good fun. I know, did you say you served on board Derwent, didn't you? You talking about ships breaking down, I remember in our particular deployment, we were all supposed to leave Stirling and everyone steamed off except Derwent because just when we were supposed to steam off, uh, she suddenly had mechanical problems. So it's funny you should say that. They, they held up all right, remembering they were commissioned into service yes. in, the, in the 60s, so early yes. 60s. So they did, they did pretty good. As you said, a lot of service to the Navy. Darren, you then go on exchange to America. Can you tell us about your experience with the United States Navy? Any exchange, of course, is a great opportunity for anyone. I was lucky enough to go over there and I was teaching celestial navigation, which is a, a 
probably might be seen as a bit random, but I went over to the United States Naval Academy at Annapolis and there I instructed navigation. It was a great opportunity. I was only quite young myself. So I was only three or four years older than the students. So it was sort of ironic going over there as a professor where A, I didn't have an education and B, I wasn't much older than the students, but built some really good relationships that I still have today. And this is the benefit of any exchange posting. It's not necessarily about the job you do over there, but about the relationships you form. I'm still friends with many of the other um, professors around that time that were, are now of my sort of star ranked position, but equally so the students that are now coming through as the senior commanders and captains that I'm working with. And when I engage with say Pacific Fleet or as part of my current role, there are people there that were my students that are now, oh, I remember you, sir. You were the the Aussie that walked around in shorts and said sphere funny. And I was also very lucky, even though I'm a, a Victorian and know nothing about rugby, I was also pretty involved in their um, rugby program because the Naval Academy, besides being thousands of students, to get selected to go to the academy, you need to get a a senator's recommendation. So it's pretty hard to get into the the Naval Academy. And most of them are probably the best of the best from their high school. So the high school quarterback or they suddenly join the Naval Academy and they're just one of many. And so those that couldn't quite make the football team for the college, a lot came and played rugby. So we were fielding six or seven teams a week to a pretty high standard in in the 90s when rugby wasn't really a big thing in the U.S., but the contacts are still strong now and I look forward. It's probably what a, a country I visit the most just to catch up with friends. And you were there at a time where you were a young guy and you're single. How long was your posting there? Uh, two and a half years. Yeah, that's fantastic. Oh, it was an amazing opportunity and probably, well, it was my first shore posting. I'd always been at sea before that. Darren, let's jump ahead a bit and we'll leave America, although I know you have very fond memories there. And now you're on HMAS Stewart when you were deployed to the North Arabian Gulf. You've now been promoted to a Lieutenant Commander. Can you tell us about that journey and and that deployment in particular? Probably one of the life-changing, career-changing moments, 2004. So we were deployed over there as part of what they called then Op Catalyst, or Operation Catalyst, the, the International Coalition Against Terrorism. I think that started, if I remember rightly, in probably about 2003. So we went over there in April 2004. And the role was assisting the the multinational forces with the the Iraq stabilisation. And so it was a bit of a different role. And our primary role as the the ship over there was to protect the two oil terminals, Avot and Kaod, as we called them over there. And that was in the northern, northern part of the Arabian Gulf. Our primary role, we pretty much just had sectors around the two terminals. Our role was to protect them. At that stage, there was we had USS Yorktown and Firebolt, and they were both assigned to us. And the CO of Stuart, our commander at the time, he was in charge of the whole security operation up there. So what we would do, we would normally, when we're patrolling and protecting we would send our boarding parties over to board and investigate the dows if they entered the security zone, the dows being the the old um, traditional fishing boats. And on this occasion, which was the the 24th of April, so just before Anzac Day, and interestingly, the Prime Minister was actually due to join us that following day for Anzac Day as a a surprise visit into the the Middle East. We had a a dow that was closing the terminal and we directed for the USS Firebolt, which is just a a small um, patrol boat to send its boarding party to investigate one of the dows. It closed, unfortunately got alongside the dow and the dow exploded. We were about four miles away. So we closed, it was, it was a huge explosion. I was up on the, on the bridge at the time. And so we obviously very quickly closed and also launched our Seahawk, Seahawk helicopter. The helicopter was over the scene very quickly and started to attempt to recover as many as, as the, of the survivors that, as we could. Um, it even got to the stage when the, the Senso, the, a young leading seaman, so a young sailor, saw that they were struggling to, because of their wounds, they were struggling to get themselves into the recovery harnesses. So he actually jumped into the water from the helicopter. Obviously, there was lots of oil and debris and everything there. 
He then um, assisted the recovery of the people. We end up ultimately just moving the, the casualties back on board Stuart so we could then medically evacuate them back from there. Pretty tough time, obviously. Three sailors were, three of our US shipmates lost their lives that day. Um, it really brought home why we were there. I think probably up to that stage we were being a little bit complacent, doing not really understanding why we were there, thinking that it was a, a lot of nothing was happening. In hindsight, uh, a war where nothing's happened is a good one, um, but that activity brought the crew together, obviously, something that will keep us together forever, and the crew get together regularly. We keep in touch, and I know it's been a fairly... Uh, Different people have obviously handled it differently and there will always be demons for some people with regards to that. But I know that it definitely brought us together. Like any any ship that supports a incident like this and hey, most recently and again on Anzac Eve, one of my jobs was looking after the or directing the ship that went to close and support the Indonesian submarine last week. So one of our ships, HMAS Ballarat, steamed to the assistance of our Indonesian brothers and sisters. Um, unfortunately, they were unable, uh, there was no survivors, but we assisted the Indonesians in their search and provided um, a lot of assistance with our helicopter. And we also just not only assisted them in the search, but provided them with that support that a, a good neighbour and allied partner should be able to provide to another mariner. So it reminds us, incidents like these remind us that it's an inherently dangerous work environment in what we do, but working together closely with your shipmates and having complete faith that um, they have your back and they have the skills and the training that will keep you safe. Actually, Darren, just on that Indonesian submarine for a moment, then we'll go back to the Firebolt. It was shocking to see, you know, when they eventually got the images of the submarine up about how it had broken up, you know, there were three distinct parts of the sub that they were showing. You know, we can only wish that it was quick and instantaneous for those guys because I couldn't think of a worse way to go. And to think if you were entombed in that, you weren't going to get out. You know, you just don't want to have to think about that scenario. I mean, very valid point that um, this trade that we do in the military, it's real and sometimes it's dangerous even in peacetime. Darren, going back to the firebolt, so tell us about this ballsy guy that jumps out of the helicopter. So he obviously took that upon himself. No one would have ordered him to release his harness. So I'm sort of guessing the helicopter would have come down pretty close to water level when he's jumping, what, 10, 20 feet sort of thing into that muck, and then he pops up. So does he have a harness on him or he, he just goes in for Okay, so he's got a harness. What happens then? You, you, you can obviously see this, I imagine, with your binoculars on deck. And that's the thing. We, we were still closing, so we couldn't see it. So we don't know, which makes it even harder, especially for the, for the CO. He trusts the flight commander, who has command of the helicopter, that he will do the right thing. And in this case, they did do the right thing. And the decision that was made by the flight commander on the day in conjunction with that leading seaman to allow him to do that was the right thing to do. And they had the correct equipment on that then basically enabled them to help other people. Getting into a harness in the water with a helicopter over the top of you is obviously not an e easy task at the best of times. If you are seriously injured and cannot do it yourself, that's where the assistance of this leading seaman saved these people's life. He got a medal of gallantry, I think. If I remember rightly, and um, I probably should know that, but he was definitely recognised for his bravery for what he did. Firebolt was actually quite small; it was a patrol boat, so it's not a, it's not big. After all of this played out, and we finally sort of took a, a few deep breaths a few days later, and we actually brought Firebolt alongside Stuart, so they berthed alongside the sea, and we had a, a moving ceremony together, which was probably good for everyone. I think not only the crew of Firebolt, but for ourselves. I imagine they would have learnt a lot from that incident as to perhaps a revised procedure for a patrol boat approaching one of these craft. And, and indeed, I've done basic training, but if you 
dive into a tank and then you've got a cable attached to you and you're immersed in all that oil and confusion, you know, a lot could have gone wrong. That able seaman really did a great job and full full credit to him. Good on him. Yeah, and just to clarify that, I'm not sure if it was USS Firebolt wasn't the, it, it was their boarding party. So the actual patrol boat was back like we were. It was their, it was their boarding party with the rib that um, unfortunately was part of the explosion. Let's go um, forward to July 2005. You have your first command, a patrol boat. How was the new responsibility of being a commander yourself? It's interesting, isn't it? It's that step where you go from suddenly being an officer, a good serving officer to a CO, to being the CO. Words like accountability and responsibility suddenly become part of your vocabulary where they may not have been as important. And patrol boats just as you see with Firebolt, and we talk about her. It's a very small family, um, very close family. Some of my best friends remain those that I met on board HMAS Ipswich back in those days. They are a very hardworking part of our Navy. Back then, it was an interesting time because we were transitioning from Operation Relics to Operation Resolute, and I think that happened about 2006 or so. Still all about the border protection and maintaining our interests in the maritime domain, but it's when it evolved away from the, the fishing boats towards the CFs or the suspected irregular entry vessels. So my time in Ipswich was all about the fishing boats. We didn't have any irregular immigration issues to manage. We were all about the fishing boat, especially with the Fremantle-class patrol boat versus the Armadale-class patrol boat. They were much smaller and, for example, when you sailed on your Fremantle-class patrol boat, you normally changed into pirate rig once you were clear of harbour because we didn't have washing machines and it was just a little bit more, with all due respect, McHale's Navy-esque because we that was the type of boat we were operating on and um, we would spend our time chasing fishing boats, which was busy, but we'd always keep reminding ourselves that no one should lose life over a fish so we had to always keep that in the back of our mind and the context of that. And Darren, just for our listeners, when you say pirate rig, you mean civvies? Yeah, so your sports rig, because if you stayed in your uniform, you wouldn't be able to wash it as easily as you can these days. At least that was the excuse maybe we convinced ourselves of. But those days, the Fremantle class patrol boats were a little bit different and a little bit different uh, working environment than they are now for the Armadale class. A great patrol boat is a great place for a, a young junior officer to, to learn their trade, whether it's ship driving or leadership. A patrol boat, you're still quite young and a lieutenant commander still reasonably senior, but you still don't get the strategic consequence of things. You're still at a tactical mindset that works very well but you're also probably interested in keeping everyone happy as in being friends with people because you still don't quite get it. And that's the important evolution of command when you go from a patrol boat to a major fleet unit and you see that you might have done things a little bit differently back in your first command when you, you thought you, Lieutenant Commander Grogan knew everything, absolutely, just ask him. He didn't know as much as Sub-Lieutenant Grogan knew because, of course, he knew everything. Um, and as you become more senior, you, you realise that you really don't know everything and it makes you a, probably a, a better better leader and a, a better ship driver and a better CO. And that's why the Navy have got the chiefs, huh? Absolutely. And on a, on a patrol boat especially, you rely on your, on your very smart sailors to remind you that firstly, you're not on a warship and secondly, that you don't know everything. It's a warship, but it's not a major warship. So, Darren, what was your compliment on board Ipswich? I think it might have been 22 maybe, and they were very cramped quarters. Uh, you'd have a, the CO and you'd have an, an XO and a navigator and then normally uh, two other junior officers. So there was two officers or CO got his own cabin, which was luxury, and then the XO would share with the junior officer and the navigator would share with the junior officer. And then we'd have a, a chief petty officer as the engineer. The problem with your patrol boat is it's really just you and the XO and, of course, the chiefs, but it all sort of stops with you and everyone looks to you. No, absolutely. And that's when you start to really, really grasp the significance of, of the sea command and you reflect on if something goes wrong and you having to write that letter to a sailor's family 
it really sort of brings it home the, the importance of what you're doing, the importance of trusting your team and that you don't do it all yourself. And if you don't work together as a team, you won't get through it. Then in 2008, you're promoted to be a commander and taking a posting that coincides with a significant increase in illegal maritime arrivals. Yeah, what a time. 2008 in Darwin, I was the operations officer for headquarters Northern Command, so the J3. It was an interesting time. I'd just come back from staff course in Kuwait, which was also very exciting. Again, one of those opportunities that you don't normally think is going to happen, but once you do it, you love it. Came back to Darwin and this was a job they offered me on promotion. On any promotion, you, you click your heels together and go, thank you for the opportunity, sir. And Darwin probably wasn't my first preferred choice. I arrived there and I still remember taking over from a, one of my older mentors and he was a previous J3 and he sort of made a comment of, oh, we have these things called CEBs, but we haven't seen any for a while and it's all pretty quiet. It's a bit of a sleepy hollow up here. And I was like, yeah, okay, good. And a couple of weeks later, the first one arrived and they just never stopped. But that was all, again, we're apolitical as naval officers. We serve the, the government of the day and we don't get involved in expressing our political opinions, but... I think history will show that there were some strategic policy changes that took place and the CIEV started coming. And I use the word CIEV and that's a suspected, at that time, illegal entry vessel. We changed the nuance of the word during that time to irregular entry vessel. And it was obviously a political minefield. We as naval operators and more importantly, as COs and the crews out there on the water, we're implementing our government policy, but it was a, a really, really tough time. And it was tough for our sailors that had gone from being people that went chasing fishing boats in their pirate rig to sailing on their, their warship in full battle rig, not knowing what they were going to come across over the horizon. And what they did come across was obviously unseaworthy, leaking boats, some with sick, pregnant women and children, and us having to, a young CO and a, a young crew, having to manage a, a really tough situation like that. Um, it was, yeah, it was tough times. And as commander, you were based in Darwin at that time, you know, responsible for sending out the patrol boats? Yes. So as the, as the operations officer, they call it the J3. So we would send the different boats to the different areas, obviously using queuing from planes and other sources of when we knew of a, a CIEV was arriving and we would either send a boat to board it or we would have them in the strategic entry points to wait for them to come. And then depending on their government policy of the day and the seaworthiness of the boat and many other factors that we would consider, we would then determine whether we took that boat to Christmas Island or turned it back. And that was a constant cycle. And there was so many factors that every single situation changed and every CO and crew had to manage every situation differently. And there were a couple of very sad events that came from that. The sailors had to live through. And I, I think we will find that Op Resolute and that time will be a bit of an Afghanistan moment for our Navy when it comes to some of our mental health challenges going forward because we, it's very hard to prepare a young sailor to be pulling a dead body out of the water. Um, but they had to do at times. So, Darren, I can see why the Navy posted you to that position because you had been effectively the CO on Ipswich, which is, you know, the patrol boats that you're tasking, you're sending out to do this job. So they know you know what the CO is like having to do that job. But fortunately for you, you're back on base. You're not actually the CO who has that moral dilemma of trying to render assistance to someone on the seas as is the law of the sea, versus following orders. Dealing with all this conflict and turmoil and sadness at that time, certainly you join the Navy, you don't sort of expect to have things like that happen, but then look how you were organising the rescue mission for that Indonesian submarine the other day. You know, like that is what the Navy does. 
it turns up and does what the government tells us to do and often it's not pretty. Yeah, absolutely. And deep down, no matter, no matter what a government is in, in office and no matter what their policies, we're all still human and we all will always still care about other people's lives, especially if it comes to a mariner to a mariner, we'll always have that linkage. In 2010, you then find yourself in charge of delivering an operational patrol boat fleet. Yeah, so I, I went from the ops job, which was the building next door in Darwin, and then on the Monday, on the Friday I finished there and on the Monday I packed up my stuff and started working the building next door, which was basically providing that capability to the operations world. And it was not only a tough time because our Armadale class patrol boats were still finding their feet, so we were still getting through the maintenance challenges that come from that, but also the demand was so high. Because of what we just spoke about, everyone kept want, needing more boats. It was a challenging time for the, the Navy to provide the effect required, which it did, but more so as I've also just sort of discussed before, I, I took a, a priority of my job at the time was also to try and come up with a, a mental health strategy to try and support the, the crews. We didn't really have one at the time. Patrol boats were an interesting beast because they weren't a major fleet unit, so they don't go to war. So they lived in their own sort of world up in Darwin. Um, and this was the first time where they had a really serious role that was probably busier and more important and tougher on the sailors than what the major fleet units were experiencing. Ships that went over to the Gulf, people like myself that went over to the Middle East, they had a, a mental health strategy. Not always, some might not say the best one. It didn't always work out the best, but there was a strategy. We didn't actually have one in the, the patrol boat community. So we instigated one of them and hopefully that will that still, still goes today. Let's look at when you take command of HMA Sirius in 2013. It's, it's quite a step up for you because you go from patrol boats sort of into the bigger ships. Tell us about that. Yeah, it's a, being, a navig being a specialist navigator, tankers are... Uh, are something we do. They don't have any guns, but navigation's harder, ship handling's harder due to the, the size of the ship. But I do remember the very first time I, I posted on board and I embarked via a rib. It was over in Western Australia where she was based and I got picked up ashore and deciding now Commander Grogan's going to command. He's never been on board the ship before, so I'd never actually stepped on board the ship previously in my naval career. So it was all that emotion of, you name it, you could imagine the different emotions. And if you look at the side of the ship, I get this rib and it parks alongside the ship and then it gets hauled up the side of this just wall of steel. It's just this monster of a ship. And I'm just sort of looking up going, oh, what have I got myself into? It was a great ship. It was a, a civilian ship that was converted. It was a commercial tanker before it was converted. And this was sort of to fill the gap when the, the West Australia fire incident fire happened. So we brought her out. She's still going strong as our only tanker, currently operational. Excitedly out two new tankers, uh, supplies being commissioned. So that's here and also stalwarts coming soon. But that was a great couple of years. It's a, Again, it's a close to a patrol boat. So it's still only 60 or 70 crew. So it's only a small family. It might be a, a big ship, but it's only the, the crew size is quite small. We'd always laugh and I'd always, with my counterparts and my peers and the, the tanker is not, not a real warship. And we'd always, always, of course, argue going, oh, well, you're not going to get to the war to fire your missiles without my fuel. But great time. Great. Any, any sea commands, an amazing experience. You've definitely evolved a bit from, especially considering the roles I did prior to this, in, most importantly, the, the military assistant, the EMA to the chief of joint operations. So you're starting to understand this word they call strategic. Your brain's getting out of the tactical world of being fleet and getting up to the strategic space and understanding how the, the centre works a lot more. So I was very much more prepared for that. Your, your whole approach to leadership has also changed on the patrol boat it's very much about you and I'm going to command my, I've been selected to be the CO. So it's all about me and the sailors will do what I want them to do. And as you've evolved, you get to the stage when you start to realize that it's not all about you and it's all about the sailors. And that transition in your leadership mindset is a big one. And you see it a lot from a patrol boat to a, a CO of a major fleet unit. And even more so when I was lucky enough to get the, a follow on command as a captain, your whole mindset has changed completely. 
in a good way. So let's move on to HMA success. Tell us about that. Ah, that was one of those wedgie commands when the command you get when you weren't expecting it. Um, I was, I'd been selected to be the CEO of HMA Supply, the, the new tanker, so which was very exciting. And I was looking forward to commissioning her. And I was on the, the captain's course. We have a commander designate course where you spend six months or four or five months thinking about your next command and going through all the policy and learning a bit, practicing your navigation and, and everything else. And um, I was on that course and unfortunately for the CO of success and fortunately for me, he did an injury and had to get landed and wasn't Seager, wasn't fit for sea. And I was the obvious choice. So I was, sort of got the call up to head to sea and I head off to, to sea a few weeks later and ended up staying there to decommission her, which was an amazing experience. Like she has such a strong history of uh, over 30 years and what she had achieved as a ship. It was just an honour to be able to bring her home the way we did. It was a, a big crew, 200 people. We spent a lot of time at sea traveling around before decommissioning. She operated, she was humming along for an old girl. She was really doing well. And um, it was a hardworking, happy crew. And it was a good way to finish her life, her service on such a high and an amazing experience. I was very honored to be given that opportunity and um, something I'll remember forever. So Darren, again, for our listeners, can you explain what sort of ship success is? Uh, success, like Sirius, she's a, a tanker, so a replenishment ship, basically the petrol station. So for all the other warships out at sea, she would drive around, we would have all the other ships come up alongside us and we would provide them with fuel and water and sometimes logistics. When a ship, especially since we're deploying a lot as task groups now. So a couple of ships will deploy together as a task group of three or four ships and they'll take with them a, a tanker, a replenishment ship, which is what HMA success was. And that would enable us to go much further for endurance without having to proceed into port to get fuel. And as I said, we've got those two new ones coming out shortly, or one's already been commissioned and the second one's due to join us in a couple of months' time, um, which will be the the newer, more warship-like version of what Sirius and Success are, um, which will have more of a, an operations room and the capability that will come with that is just the next level up. Very exciting. I suppose uh, if I was a ship, I'd be a bit worried about you because every time you turn up on board, you're decommissioning ships, huh? Yeah, well, that's what I mean. I don't know if, a, depending on if that's, I don't know if that's a compliment or an insult to me, so I, I try not to overthink it. But... I did. That's meant I was lucky enough to get selected to be the new one, but then they took that off me. So maybe it is a sign. I'm not sure. Maybe they didn't trust me to, to commission the new one, but luckily they promoted me, so I can't complain. So Darren, after all that active naval work, your career continues with more recent appointments. I mean, for example, you've been Director General Maritime Operations when we had Bushfire Assist, which is Operation Malakuta, and then Flood Assist, Fiji Assist, COVID assist. I mean, are there any particular stories in those operations that you'd like to share? Uh, I think one of the really positive stories, besides the fact that it's great to see our ADF supporting our country men and women in the way that we have been when it comes to these natural disasters. The Malakuta um, bushfire assist was a, was a big one for our Navy. We had a bit of a, a dark time back in 2011 with Yazi when the, the cyclone hit and some of our ships just weren't ready to support. We had some seaworthiness issues and we focused back then on making that better. We introduced um, the Rizzo review happened and we looked at our seaworthiness and readiness of our people. And from there, we worked really hard and we landed on basically Malakuta. For Malakuta, the Navy at short notice deployed three ships down to Malakuta to save our countrymen and women. And they did that in a, a seaworthy state in advance of their readiness notice. So all ships are at a readiness notice. Those ships sailed on that occasion quicker than they needed to. We couldn't do that for Yazi. So for us as a Navy, this was a, a really positive thing for us to be able to do. It reflects where our Navy's at now and all the hard work that many people have done over the years with regards to our seaworthiness. Also, we talk about the Fiji Assist. What HMAS Adelaide did over Christmas was amazing. Not many 
people saw that. I know there was the media about it, but they sailed out there on Christmas Eve and spent Christmas and New Year's away supporting one of our neighbours with Fiji. That type of operation is the backbone of what we do as a Navy, and it's really, really important into this region, especially as we now look at Defence Strategic Update. I, I'm sure you've read that, and any of our listeners, a plug, the Defence Strategic Update 2020, Google it, get out the internet, get on your phone, and it's the first time in 30-something years of my naval career where my boss, the, the Prime Minister, has told us, me, what my job is. It's unclassified, it's just on the internet, shape, deter, respond, it's all about our neighbours and our, our region, the Indo-Pacific region. Things like Fiji Assist is us supporting them. We go 24-7 support out to the Southwest Pacific. That's all supporting our neighbours in the region. COVID, obviously, it's ravished the world. We're very quick to assist our neighbours when it comes to the COVID Assist, whether it's Papua New Guinea or other places in the Southwest Pacific. I think that's what I've probably been the, the proudest of in how our Navy has managed COVID. What we have done in the last year and a half, and I touch wood as we've had no positive COVID case on any of our ships, and I definitely bang my head against the wood with that because obviously it's still only out there. But what our sailors have done in the last 12 months, we had sailors' ships deploying last year for 100 days without a port visit. As someone who served at sea like yourself and myself, we can't fathom that. That is an amazing effort by our people. We're so proud of what they've done. And you just reflect on, oh, you try and reflect, you can't even imagine what it would be like. But it's important for us to continue to do what we do, even in a, a COVID environment, in the knowledge that hopefully in the, in the near future, we'll be able to step back and revert back to our previous ways so we can enjoy our time and see that little bit more. Um, it's amazing what the fleet's doing and I don't think our countrymen and women appreciate what the Navy is doing. Not me. Hey, I've got an easy life. I'm sitting here at home doing this, whereas we currently have sails at sea that are deploying within the region without proper port visits due to COVID. Obviously, we're working really hard with respite and to try and look after them but we're very proud of that and the whole country should be proud of them. So Darren, what's next for you? Funny you should say that. It got announced last week. So lucky you asked me this week and not last week. I'm the Commander Joint Task Force 661. So as of, and you've got that look on your face of a wonder what that is. And it's a very good question. As of January, our contribution to the, the Indo-Pacific strategy, I've spoken about the Defence Strategic Update and our, our focus towards the Indo-Pacific region. We have a, a task force that will deploy around the region for focus on engagement and our partnership in Southeast Asia. We'll have a, an LHD with a, some embarked army forces and a, an air component as well and deploy around the Indo-Pacific region. I'll be lucky enough to join them for some of that and command that task force, which is very exciting. And that's a, a one-year job. And after that, we'll see see what happens. I'm getting old, early 50s now, look at retirement. I'm very lucky that I honestly think that I've probably, probably three ranks higher than I thought I'd ever get. So it gets pretty tight when you get to this stage and, and your next jobs. I would be sad to move on from the Navy, but only so many can go so far. And I, I look forward to when the time is right to starting my next career, which will be in the, the veteran space. So I'll retire, find my niche in that space somewhere to help our people. Well, Darren, certainly talking of careers, I mean, your experience um, with the bushfires, the floods, the Fijis and COVID, I mean, we're seeing these disasters sadly happen more often now. And the government actually, to their credit, are drawing on ex-servicemen often to help with these things. So whether you're currently serving or recently retired, I think your experience would be very handy and I'm sure we'll have sadly more disasters that will need help. So speaking on careers, what can you say that a career in the Navy could do for a young man or woman today joining the forces? What an amazing opportunity. What a time to, to be joining the, the military, especially the Navy. Like, we have, through the 2016 White Paper, when they sort of came up with a, a plan for our future shipbuilding, and even more so now with the 2020 updates, 
there's billions and billions and billions of dollars being spent on the Navy of building our new ships, whether they're the, the new submarines, new OPVs, the tankers. The future is so bright with opportunity. We're growing to a, a we're about 15,000 now. We're going to grow to a 20,000 workforce for Navy. And the opportunities that come with that are so much more than what I had. We talk about and we laugh about all my ships decommissioning. That's <laughs> because the, when I was in the Navy, I was at a stage where the ships were getting to the end of their life. The next generation over the next decade is the complete opposite, where we're just going to be commissioning one, two ships every year. And that opportunity is amazing for the future. And I think we're much better now at the leadership side of things. So I think that the work environment is a good one. It has evolved and hey, there's always going to be good days and bad days. And we all we need to acknowledge that. But I think what we're offering now as a Navy is so much better than it probably was. And that is seen at the, the highest levels. I know that if I had the opportunity, I'd much prefer to be starting my career now than finishing it because there's just so much opportunity. Darren, thanks for talking with us today. I don't have to say thank you for your service because it's ongoing. Thank you for your continuing service. We look forward to hearing more of these wonderful ships that are coming on board, but thank you for sharing your story with us today and we'll look forward to hearing further of your developments. Thank you. And if I could just finish um, with that opportunity, then I think I've spoken about a few subjects that, that may trigger some people. Please make sure if that do, speak to someone. There's lots of places out there where you can find that person to speak to. It's really important. Thank you. I'm Angus Horden and you've been listening to Life on the Line. If you want to hear more stories from Navy personnel on border protection and the realities they're facing at sea, in Season 3, listen to number 64, Jodie Farmer. As I came up, he must have just caught me out the corner of his eye. I identified ourselves, Royal Australian Navy boarding party team, I need you to come with me. And all of a sudden, he pulled out this... I'm assuming it was a machete, but it kind of looked like a giant Aladdin sword. It was huge and I called weapon. And for more on COVID Assist, in Season 4, listen to the bonus episode, COVID-19 Task Force, with John Fruin. Unfortunately, with what's been going on in Victoria, we're now right back to very intense activities. This is very much a fight on the home front. Follow us at Life on the Line podcast on Instagram, Facebook and YouTube, at L-O-T-L pod on Twitter and at Thistle Productions on LinkedIn. Our website is www.lifeonthelinepodcast.com. Life on the Line is brought to you by Thistle Productions. Artwork by Big Cat Design. Music by Dan Van Werkhoven. Thanks for listening. And lest we forget.